Granny, for inviting us here. As you hear, we come from Ireland. We come from a place Ireland. called Ballymaloo, which means the town's land of sweet honey. And we're here, Rory and Rachel and I, to tell the story of the inspirational woman who's now my mother-in-law. My father-in-law was a, a farmer and a horticulturalist. And in fact, in quite a big way, he exported tomatoes and mushrooms and uh, cucumbers and so on. They had a big orchard. And they farmed uh, at Ballymaloo for about 16 years. They raised their children. And Myrtle gradually taught herself how to cook. She had wonderful produce from the farm and all of that. And she was really, really convinced of the importance of feeding her children really good, nutritious food, because she felt very strongly that the food was, should be the medicine rather than anything else. Ballymaloo is in the middle of a 400-acre farm. It's very close to the sea, down on the south coast of Ireland, east of Cork City. And Ivan was a very progressive farmer and uh, known really outside Ireland as being very progressive. And uh, regularly, farming groups would come to visit uh, the farm to, to see what he was doing. And with the editor of the Irish farming newspaper, The Farmer's Journal, they, Myrtle gave them lunch and hospitality, as she, they always would. And Myrtle began to think about maybe the idea of opening a restaurant. Now, it's, we're way out in the wilds of the country, and it was unheard of at that stage to open a restaurant in your own house outside a town or city. And, uh, but anyway, my, the, they decided, chatted about this for a while, and eventually I remember my husband telling me uh, that uh, they got a letter at Newtown School in Waterford, there was a Quaker school, uh, to say that the restaurant was open. And they were delighted, the children, they couldn't wait to get home at the holidays. They thought their mother would be serving, uh, that they would, uh, they'd have proper restaurant food, you know, they'd have <laughs> mixed grills or scampi or something else. And they were disgusted when they came home to discover she was feeding the guests exactly the same as she fed them. But I mean, after all, uh, they had their own Jersey herd, so they had, uh, you know, of course, of course, uh, lovely uh, homemade ice cream made from the thing, their own pork, their chickens, uh, a two-acre walled garden was right in the middle of the farm. Uh, and so Martin had been cooking wonderful food for them. And everything, of course, was done uh, from scratch. From the first day, she wrote the menu every day, depending on what was in the garden, what was in the greenhouses, and what fish, fresh fish came in from the boats in Ballycotton and so on. And she wrote the menu, hand wrote the menu, she wrote it in English at a time when all of the other restaurants, uh, their menus were in French, and that was a little bit intimidating for people as well. And she, kind, she cooked the kind of food uh, that she uh, knew how to cook, simple, delicious food from fantastic ingredients. She just cooked what was around her, you know, and, and within two years she had the top rating in the food guides in the British Isles. And uh, so th then the real chefs in the country said, who the hell is this woman? who has you know, who's no training, who has just writes the menu every day. Did you ever hear anything so ridiculous? And so it was considered to be amazing. Uh, so, and everybody in the kitchen uh, were local boys and girls that she had just brought into the kitchen and taught how to cook from scratch herself. Uh, so um, fast forward to 1968, I was again trying to think what to do. I couldn't get into a top restaurant. I was a woman. Men were chefs. Uh, so basically, uh, and I was trying to think what on earth to do. And basically, then I met one of the senior lecturers said to me one day, she asked me why I hadn't got a job, everybody else in my class had, and I told her what I wanted. And she told me about this woman that she'd been at a dinner party uh, a few nights earlier. They were talking about this extraordinary woman down in Cork who had opened a restaurant in her own house and, uh, and you know, they were making their own ice cream and all, of, all the lovely produce and everything they had. And she said, this is the name of the woman, write to her. And the name on the piece of paper was Myrtle Allen, who's now my mother-in-law. So I <laughs> became a member of the family by the simple expedient of marrying the boss's son. So anyway, uh, so I came to Valley Malou. I, she, taught, uh, she taught me the opposite of e practically everything I'd learned at hotel school, but she reinforced everything that my mother had uh, stood for and all of that. And so on her menu, she had foods that you'd never see on a restaurant menu, like le whiting and mackerel and uh, gooseberries and blackcurrants and things in season. And at that time, Egon Rune Guide uh, described uh, uh, Bali Malou as a haven of sophistication and gracious living. Uh, so that was uh, really nice. So what wasn't produced on, in the farm and on the gardens itself, 
Uh, she sent out the word locally that she wanted somebody to rear ducks or geese or chickens for her, that kind of thing, and they all came in. So she built up an amazing network of about 150 uh, small producers uh, to supply her. And uh, uh, the other thing is, when the, the other terribly important thing, and for all of us as chefs and so on, is when they came to Ballymaloo and de uh, delivered the produce, she would say, what do you need to be paid to produce something like this for me? And she would pay them either on delivery, because people, small producers can't wait for their money, or certainly within a month, which is, was, is really good. It was a very good example for all of us. Meanwhile, Tim and I had four kids. We cooked in uh, Ballymere, I cooked in Ballymere several nights a week, and then we could see in the late 70s, sorry, the writing on the wall was on the wall for horticulture, and so on. The labour costs started to rise. There was uh, the oil crisis, 25% inflation. We were heating five acres of greenhouses with oil, so we had to do something else. And we converted some of our farm buildings into a cooking school. Uh, and Rory and I started the school together. And uh, we, the first thing we do on the first day is introduce the students to the, far, the gardeners and the farm manager. And we say, these are the people who are uh, cooking and looking out, at least who are growing and looking after and feeding the animals for the food you're going to be cooking with for the next 12 weeks. And then we go down, and I stand outside on the steps, and I run my hands through the soil, and I say, this is where, remember, this is where it all starts in the good earth. Uh, the, uh, the, and this would be a wheelbarrow of compost that's made uh, from the students, from the scraps of the students' food uh, from a year earlier. The first recipe they get is how to make compost. <laughs> and uh, then uh, we go, uh, to, I have to shock them out of thinking that these are potential chefs that food is something that comes wrapped in plastic off a supermarket shelf. I need them to think about how it's produced, where it comes from, the breed, the feed. And I quote Lady Eve Balfour, who was one of the founders of the Soil Association, and say, remember, uh, that basically, the health of the soil, the health of the plant, the health of the animal, and the health of the human are all one and indivisible. Mm. And then we walk down to the farm and gardens. The first thing we show them, these potential chefs and cooks, is how to sow a seed. We give them a little plant to plant into the ground. And then they watch it growing for the next three months. And that is the best way I know to give people a respect for food and the people who produce it. To give, the, give them a seed and let them plant it into the ground. And let them realize how long it takes to grow into something that you can eat. And it does two things. It gives them respect, but also they n never again pr uh, complain about the price of food when they realize how much it, what it takes. If I really had my way, I wouldn't let any cook or chef into a kitchen without having spent a year on farming and gardens so that they would actually have a... <laughs> And as somebody already mentioned, it's the, learning how food is produced is an incredibly important thing. So they go out with the gardeners. Then after that, it's three months of gastro boot camp, basically. A lot of the students come in at even at 7.30 in the morning. They learn how to milk a cow. They'll make butter every day, cheese, yogurt, do, of course, a huge amount of cooking. We put eggs into the incubator so they hatch out as chickens. They go foraging down to the beach. We introduce them to the producers when they bring the food to, the, when, uh, to us. We introduce them to Nora Hearn with the ducks and so on, so they can meet the people who are producing uh, a lot of their food and encourage them to build up a network around them when they leave us of producers, because uh, the quality of the produce is everything. Um, so, and so we spend, uh, or, so we pass on what, we're, what I'm doing, what Roy's doing, and Rachel and all of us at the school are, and now students come from all over the world. We have one teacher with every six students, etc. What we're doing is passing on the philosophy and the passion that Myrtle passed on to us and adding uh, to it. This is what Myrtle and Ivan's legacy have created. They have created something so, which enables us to live on the land that we love in a, and create employment in a very rural area of Ireland. And people come from all over the world to Ballymaloo to see what's cooking there. And so I hope you'll come and we'll be there to welcome you. And thank you, Rennie, for inviting us. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.